right, so welcome to the Virginia Cyber Range Weekly Workshop. This is David Raymond, and um, this week we will be talking a little bit more about reverse engineering. So if you want to participate with us today, um, this is the slide I show, <clears throat> I've, I've shown every week for the last few weeks. We have a practice CTF that you can that you can play. You, your students can join this too, so just go to https backer.io slash practice CTF. If you don't already have an account, click the register button and you can start playing right away. Um, <clears throat> for some of this stuff, if you wanna, if you wanna um, sort of play along with me here, then it would be helpful to have a Linux, a Kali Linux uh, environment to do it in. You can do that on a local VM. You can do it in a CyberRange VM. If you don't have access to a CyberRange VM, you can um, <clears throat> use this invitation code. So log in to your uh, Virginia CyberRange account, uh, uh, or just go to the, um, I'm sorry, go to console.virginiacyberrange.net and, um, and click the thing that says have an invitation code on the login page and then type in, the, type in this invitation code and you're, you're all ready to go. Okay, weekly workshops, once a week, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Most people watch these after the fact, so they're all recorded and shared on the virginiacyberrange.org webpage. Um, if you'd like to see a particular topic, then please send us an email and we will make that topic available. A couple of bits of IoT no news for this week. I'll be very brief on the news today. <clears throat> um, over 2 million devices vulnerable because of some component flaws, peer-to-peer -peer component flaws. This is a ZDNet article. So um, IoT devices, um, if you haven't read the news lately, are, are notorious for having poor security. And a lot of it has to do with, um, well, there's really two primary factors. One of them is that um, organizations are competing to get these products out the door as quickly as possible because they want to gain market share, right? So if you're the first person that has an IP camera out on the market, then people are going to start buying your camera and um, you're going to get more market share uh, than the other guy who doesn't get their uh, uh, IP camera on the market until three months later. So people drive to get things to the market quickly so, so they can quickly make money. Um, what they sometimes uh, don't spend a whole lot of time on is the security aspect of things. The other thing that drives this is user experience, right? So people want their IoT devices to be very easy to use. They don't want to have what they call friction in the process of creating an account or logging into your device. So they sort of bypass things like two-factor authentication or complex passwords and that kind of stuff. So if you see this particular device, it's got a sticker on the side, username admin, password admin. That's not uncommon for a IoT device out of the box. So um, this particular vulnerability is actually two vulnerabilities, um, and, and it's a it's a firmware component. So a firmware component is a piece of hardware that has code embedded on it. And the thing about some of these some of these firmware components is that um, you know if you buy a device from Samsung and then you buy a device from GE, they may um, you know they're different brands, different companies but they may in fact use the same firmware. And this particular firmware component is, is used by a whole bunch of different vendors products. And it includes things like IP cameras, baby monitors, smart doorbells, DVRs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you go to this article, you can see a short list of the, of the companies uh, whose products are vulnerable to this. It's actually two vulnerabilities. One vulnerability, CVE 2019-11-219, allows attackers to rapidly discover devices that are online. And then um, CVE 2019-11-2020 allows attackers to intercept connections to devices and perform what's called a man-in-the-middle attack, and we've talked about those before, and to steal the password to a device so that they can essentially take control of it. And um, <clears throat> so, um, that's bad, right? Somebody, somebody first can identify that your device is online, and then next they can take control of it. And if they can take control of it, they can um, do things like um, there was just a story this morning in the Roanoke Times, which was a which was a um, it was actually a New York Times story, and it talked about um, uh, um, IP camera Nest brand IP cameras. So Nest is a Google company now, I think. They make uh, smart thermostats, they also make IP cameras. Nest IP cameras that were being taken over by hackers and the Nest IP cameras have this intercom capability and basically they're shouting at babies who are trying to sleep, you know, and they're doing crazy things. Um, 
they're also able to like control the thermostat in the house so they can so they can crank the heat up or they can turn it off or whatever um, <clears throat> so different things that these that these people were doing with various nest and other IOT devices um, so what do you do right uh, well you can go to see if your device is on the list of vulnerable systems at HTTPS hacked.camera and you basically put in the, the um, you know the, the uh, make and model of your device and it'll tell you if, if your device is vulnerable to this stuff it is if it is vulnerable to this stuff um, you know there are things you can do like change the password use a complex password if you can use two-factor authentication use two-factor authentication the biggest thing you can do is not make your uh, device publicly visible outside of your home network so if, if any of the configuration options on this thing asks you to turn on port forwarding on your uh, wireless access point, then that's the point where I would stop and not go any further because that's going to give people external to your home network access to devices inside the network. Here's another news story. This is actually from a few weeks ago. Well, it's from January, right, January 29th. Don't let, don't toss that bulb that knows your password. So this is about smart light bulbs. Um, smart light bulbs are, are light bulbs that you can control with a smartphone app. And um, turns out that, um, you know, of course it's a light bulb, right? So it lasts for a certain amount of time, months, maybe a year or two, and then you throw it in the trash. Uh, thing is though, that these smart light bulbs manufactured by various companies store your Wi-Fi SSID. So that's the name that you put on your, on your um, wireless access point and the encryption key in plain text. So the password that you put on your, on your, um, uh, wireless access point. Um, it stores your, your SSID and the encryption key in plain text. So basically if, if somebody can, if somebody finds your light bulb in the trash, they can, um, they can uh, pull that information off, off of this thing that, you know, you plug in some wires to it. These devices have what's called a UART interface, UART. I don't remember what that stands for, but, but it's a interface that allows external connections for troubleshooting and whatever. So you plug a few connectors onto these, uh, onto the, the board. The, this picture here is the is the control board for a smart light bulb. So you take the light bulb apart, pull out the board, plug some wires into it, you can pull out the information. Um, why is the SSID and encryption key on the, the board for the light bulb? Well, the app, the app on your smartphone that, that connects um, that, that allows you to control the light bulb, it, um, when you first connect to the light bulb, it shares the SSID and the encryption key uh, with the light bulb and has it store that in local memory and that puts the light bulb on your home network so that it can, so that all your systems be, can be uh, controlled using, you know, you, some, some of these device classes allow you to put, a, put together a little script. Uh, you know, you can say like, uh, you know, you can say, Alexa, good morning, and your coffee maker turns on, your light bulbs in the living room turn on, et cetera, et cetera. So the way that is um, facilitated is by putting all those devices on your home network. And so these things are on your home Wi-Fi, and they're, they're stored, the, the encryption key is stored locally. Um, not necessarily a good practice. Um, but another IoT uh, vulnerability. Okay, um, that's it for news. Um, this week we're going to talk a little bit more about reverse engineering and um, I'm not going to go too deep because um, it wouldn't be worth, uh, um, you know, the, the, it's you either go super deep or I, or, I, or I do sort of hit the wave tops and give some introductions and let, um, you know, so if, if I went super deep then I could teach a, a semester long class on reverse engineering. If I hit the wave tops, um, point out some tools that can be used, then what I would hope is that students and teachers can, um, if they're interested, um, do some work on their own and, uh, and try to leverage those different tools. So I'm going to hit the wave tops today. <clears throat> and you can pause here if you need to uh, get access to the CTF and or a cyber basics environment that you uh, can use to play along with this workshop. Okay, so I'm going to um, close this. I'm going to go to my login page. <clears throat> I've got a couple of slides that I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to get my um, 
environment started up so that it can um, get going in the background. Oh, it's crazy pop-ups. Okay. So workshops, I'm gonna use my server basics environment and I'm going to click start. CTF slides. <clears throat> so last week we briefly touched on what reverse engineering is. So if you want a little bit more uh, detail, then you should go back and and uh, take a look at that. Um, we talked about some tools that are used for solving CTF challenges, and so some of these we'll take a look at today. Um, we will look at uh, Obj Dump. I'll talk about GDB. We'll take a look at Ida Pro. Um, Ghidra, I'm not going to talk about, so Ghidra is a um, NSA provided tool for um, reverse engineering and it's um, pretty good actually. It, it's, it rivals something like IDA, so I mentioned last time that IDA is um, professional software for, for um, reverse engineering. It does disassembly if you pay a bunch of money. You can get it to do uh, decompilation. Um, it provides an integrated debugger, uh, but it's pretty expensive to, to really get the bells and whistles that you would need to do to do this professionally. Now I'm going to show you how to get a free version of IDA that you can use for CTFs, but to do it professionally, um, you're going to want the, the full version. So, um, so uh, it, it's again, it's very expensive and it's uh, created by a, by a company that is in a uh, Eastern European country. And um, so the NSA, instead of using Ida Pro or some similar tool, the NSA basically wrote their own tool for reverse engineering and it's called Ghidra, G-H-I-D-R-A. Um, and it's a Java-based uh, tool that, uh, um, so it can run, uh, it's, plat it's platform independent, so it can run on Linux, Windows, or uh, Mac. And uh, it has, uh, many of the same bells and whistles as Ida Pro, and it's also extensible. Well, I guess Ida Pro is extensible also, but Gaidra is extensible. That means you can write your own plugins for it. Uh, it's open source, so you can see the source code, and the NSA published the source code. Um, uh, anyway, I think it's a good service to the community, and it's pretty good software. One challenge with it is it's written in Java, so you have to have some pretty good horsepower on the system that you're using to make it uh, uh, work um, you know, to make it work well, you got to have a pretty high-powered system because Java is, is kind of notorious for, um, for um, you know, having lots of overhead and it's a little bit slow. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I, I wouldn't say that takes much away from it. Again, a good tool, but we're not going to talk about it uh, today. We're going we're gonna to touch on Ida Pro a little bit. So last time we, we did some entry level challenges. We looked at, we looked at using basic uh, Linux command line tools like strings and the file name to see if a flag is obvious. Um, and you know, again, reverse engineering challenges are executable programs for the most part. So you're not gonna, you know, it's, it's, there, there's, you can't use like uh, Wireshark, for example, to analyze these. You have to use, you know, you can use strings to see if there's any strings that you can identify as being the flag. Um, you might have to determine what type of executable it is so that you can run it on a system on which it'll run. So to do that, you, you use the file command and then you give the file name and it's going to tell you if it's a Linux executable or a Windows executable or an ARM, uh, which is an embedded systems executable. Um, you can, if, if it is, if, you know, if you're on a Linux system and, and, it's a, and it's an ELF format, this is probably the most common type of executables that you'll see in a, in a CTF, is that you'll see uh, ELF, uh, you know, Linux executable programs. Uh, so once you download it, you generally have to make it runnable. You have to give it permissions to make it so it'll run. To do that, you use the, the uh, chmod command, chmod, you use that at the command line, you give it the plus x flag, so that's, that means plus x means make this executable, and then you give it the file name, and now you can run that program at the command line. So run the program, see what it does. We did some of that last time, and we just sort of ran the program a couple times, see if we could analyze and figure out what 
what, um, how it worked. We're going to look at another approach to doing that kind of thing today using what's called static analysis. Then you can also fuzz the program so you can put a bunch of um, random stuff in it to um, see if you can get it to misbehave. And if you can get it to misbehave, then maybe you can get it to misbehave in a very particular way. And we'll see that today when we do a buffer overflow attack on, a, on an executable program. So today we're going to talk about some more advanced uh, reverse engineering challenges. Again, this is a path that um, you know the, I'm going to introduce you to it today. You're not going to um, you know in order to really get good at this, it takes a whole lot of um, time and, and experience with um, hacking on these kinds of challenges. It helps to know assembly language programming. So if you have a student who's really sharp, there's no reason he can't learn some assembly language programming in high school. Certainly in college, students learn um, assembly language programming. I learned assembly language programming um, when I was in high school back in the 1980s. Um, uh, I didn't learn a lot of it, but I learned enough that I would have been able to solve some of the CTF challenges. Um, and um, <clears throat> uh, it also helps to know some computer science uh, topics like a little bit of computer architecture and a little bit of uh, operating systems. Those aren't mandatory, um, but they, you know, but, but, you know, because of, you know, reverse engineering is, is generally a pretty advanced topic in a capture the flight competition. So it's generally, you know, very advanced high school students or, or college students who are going to do well at these kinds of challenges. So some advanced challenges you'll see have, have what are called packed executables. And, um, you know, so so we're gonna we're gonna look at using a tool, some tools to disassemble some programs uh, today. But but um, some uh, lots of programs are are use these packing tools, and the the packed the, they're essentially compressed. And so what you'll have is a program that's that's compressed to make it much smaller, and then at the very front end of the program, there's this this uh, bit of code that first thing that it does is it unpacks the, the program into memory. You know, so you have this relatively small footprint on the hard drive, and but you run the program, the very first few instructions in the program are gonna unpack the program you know, uh, into memory. And so now the, the, the program essentially expands into local memory and then you can run the program or it does its thing. But the idea here is that by packing the program, it doesn't take up as much hard drive space. This is not an uncommon technique used by software developers to, to have a smaller uh, footprint. It's also, this technique though is also used by malware authors to obscure the code and make it harder to analyze, right? So they don't want their malware to be analyzed. So they'll pack it to make it harder to disassemble and analyze. So what an analyst might have to do is let the unpacker run and then stop the program to analyze it. And that's not something we're going to do today, but this is a sort of an advanced technique that you might have to use in one of the more difficult challenges. Um, it, it also helps to have some experience with, with static and or dynamic analysis. So static analysis, that's where we disassemble and analyze the assembly language code of a program. And again, we're going to look, we're going to look at some of that today in IDA Pro and on the Linux command line. Or you can also sometimes decompile and examine a representation of the original source code. So when you have, when, when software developers write programs, they write programs in languages like C++. It's very, that's a very commonly used popular language. So you write a program in C++ and um, it's compiled and uh, then linked. And what you end up with is what's called object code. And um, that's the machine language instructions that make the program run. You can take those machine language instructions and turn them back into assembly language. That's essentially a representation, another representation of the machine language instructions, but it's much easier to read um, than, you know, the, the, the uh, machine code is simply ones and zeros. The assembly language is actual instructions, um, but it's, but it's much more difficult to read than the original C++, right? C++ has a clear um, you know, language structure and it has um, you know, very familiar commands and it has variables and all that stuff. Um, so a disassembler will take your, your, your um, 
machine code and it'll turn it into assembly language code that's easier to read than machine code, but not as easy as the original um, source code. A decompiler will take that um, assembly language code and it'll turn it into what could have been the original source code. It can't turn it into the original source code because um, you know compiling a program is, is uh, very difficult to reverse because the, uh, you know a, a bit of assembly language could have been written in various different ways in the original source code. It really depends on the compiler that you use and you know lots of other um, lots of other factors. But it will turn it into source code that could have created that bit of assembly code. And so that source code is generally easier to read than the assembly language is. The problem, though, is that you don't get all the variable names. You don't, you know, you don't get some of the context that you would otherwise have, like variable names and function names that might like make sense. Um, uh, and so, um, you know, even the decompiled version of the program is is not as easy to read as the original source code, but it's a lot better than trying to analyze uh, machine code or assembly code. Um, so that's static analysis. You take this machine code and you turn it into some other representation that's easier to read but you're still looking at static a program that's not running dynamic analysis is when you um, are running the program in a tool called a debugger and there are a couple different tools gdb is a linux command line debugger that is um that is um uh, not so easy to use. I mean, it's it's something that a, a software developer is going to be very good at because they use it to, to troubleshoot problems in their programs. But um, you know, if you're not a if you're not a programmer, then GDB is not something that you're going to use on a regular basis. It might not be super easy to use. There are also tools. Um, uh, you know, there's there's like WinDebug and there's Evans Debugger. You know, these are these are a little bit more graphical. And then you have, if you have an IDE, um, you know, if you use some, some, some the, the names of the standard IDEs for Windows are, escape me, but if you're using an, an IDE for Windows, like Visual Basic or Visual C++, then those IDEs are going to have an integrated debugger that lets you, you know, sort of step through your code in a dynamic way. But this kind of the go-to is, is this Linux uh, command line tool called GDB, and, and a student who's really good at that would be um, would be uh, pretty good at, at doing this reverse engineering stuff. Um, okay, so I'm going to give a brief introduction to this software called Ida Pro, and we're actually going to we're going to download Ida Pro and we're going to install it on a um, on our um, Virginia Cyber Range, uh, uh, Kali Linux VM. So Ida Pro is a disassembler and debugger developed by a company called Hexrays. And um, uh, it's extremely powerful and it's scriptable. And it uh, to, to purchase it, commercial licenses are expensive, right? So between $2,000 and $7,000, depending on what which of the bells and whistles that you get. And um, and you can also download free versions of it for non-commercial use from their website. And but the free versions don't have all the bells and whistles, right? It's very, it's it's sort of it's not isn't necessarily stripped down, but it doesn't have all these additional plugins and options, and and it only um, will examine certain types of executables. Fortunately, the types of executables that the free version will examine are ELF executables, which are standard Linux executables, and PE executables executables, which are uh, Windows programs. And so the, the free version of IDA is, is pretty darn good for, um, for CTF use, right? Um, you know, you can, you can use them for your CTF, your, your um, you know, it doesn't have the, the features that would allow you to like save the state of your session, which would allow you to work on it today and then come back to it next week. But for a CTF, that doesn't really matter, right? You're, you're usually going to spend a few hours solving a challenge, so you don't necessarily need to be able to save the session. You just work on it until you're done and then close it. Um, the free version also does not include the decompiler, so you, you can only disassemble. But it's still very helpful. So we're going to take a look at it. We're going to install it on Linux. The way we're going to do that is, and you can take a screenshot of this slide if you want, we're going to download 
Ida free 70 under, 70 underscore Linux dot run. And I'll show you where to get that. And that's from the hex rays website. Oh, in fact, here's the URL right here. Um, then we're going to make it executable using the ch mod. Then we're going to run it and it's going to install the uh, Ida pro software on your Kelly Linux machine. And then we're going to take a look at it. So let me now go to, um, my cyber range machine and students. <clears throat> and so here I am. And for the purpose of today, I'm just going to say hex. Well, I'm going to say Ida Pro download. It's going to take me to the hex rays download center. And I'm going to up the top here, Ida 7.0 freeware, non-commercial use. And I'm going to download the Linux version. And I'm going to save it. And now it's saved. <clears throat> so I'm going to open up my terminal window. I'm going to go to downloads. I'm going to chmod plus x. I'd, uh, run. I'm going to run it. Now I'm going to go forward. I'm going to accept the license agreement. Basically says it's free for non-commercial use. And I'm just going to keep clicking OK. OK, and that's done. All right, but now that software is that was a very Windows-like installation experience, which is not common with Linux software, but it's now installed. So there's my Ida. Picture of Ida, picture of Ada. I think it's supposed to be Ada Lovelace, but the software is called Ida Pro, I-D-A. Okay, now I'm gonna go to vector.io slash correct the CTF. Log in. Okay, so um, um, so last time we looked at this challenge called game, so I probably already had that downloaded, and I do. Okay, so now I'm gonna, um, let me go back to my PowerPoint slides for a minute. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at this program called game. So to do that, I'm gonna double click Ida icon on the desktop, select new, so it's going to say disassemble a new file. We're going to browse to open that file called game. Click OK. We're going to, you know, we're going to click OK till it opens the file, and we'll take a look at um, what this program looks like in Ida Pro. And this is it right here on the left. Um, but I'll show you how to maneuver around this thing. And you'll see that from when you look at this, you can you can even if you don't know assembly language program, you'll be able to follow the execution path of the program. And so we're going to, we're going to drill in on this section that says um, enter integer bet. And you'll, and if you look at that, you'll notice something about it. We talked a little bit about this last time, but I'm going to um, take a look you know, here at it today. So let's see here. Okay. So I'm going to, so I've got uh, this one called game. I've got this thing downloaded, right? So now I'm going to open up Ida Pro. <clears throat> um, this is the first time I've used it, so I click I agree. I'm going to disassemble a new file, and then I'm going to browse to my downloads folder, and I'm going to open up Game. And Game, uh, it, this asks me, um, do I want to download it as an ELF? So an, a, a uh, uh, an Intel 386 executable, or do I want to download it as a binary file? Well, if it's going, if it'll give it to me as an ELF, I definitely want that because then it'll disassemble the program and show me the disassembly code. So I'm going to just accept the default. I'm going to click OK, and then it's telling me that it's having trouble finding some libraries, and I don't care about that too much. So I'm just going to click OK, and here's what I get. <clears throat> 
This is the Ida Pro sort of main window. There's a whole bunch of bells and whistles across the top that do different things. I'm not going to drill into any of those today. Um, it does, the Ida Pro does have um, hooks into a debugger. So if you configure this properly, you can, you can use the visual debugger in Ida Pro. It's a really cool tool. Um, over here on the left, oh, so across the top here, you see a, this is kind of a graphical representation of the program and the different colors mean different things. So the blue are program instructions. Um, some of this other stuff is, is like the, the, the um, you know, the, the um, uh, stat, you know, the, the, the constants, you know, places where the, the program constants are stored and different uh, sections of data associated with the programs. The black stuff are gaps. Um, uh, and the blue stuff is program instructions. I don't know if this thing is ever useful for anything, but it is kind of a cool representation. Oh, okay, here you go. Blue regular function. Uh, light blue is library function. So this probably all would have been a light blue, but you, you saw that um, when I was opening it, uh, it, it was having trouble finding the libraries. So it's not representing those. Uh, and then the gray is data. So over on the left here, you see um, the functions, the names of the functions in this program. And so there, and so here we're in the main function. And a, a program has a main, you know, every, every, a C program generally has a main function. And <clears throat> So in order to move this control flow graph around, if you click, you can't click on one of the on one of the boxes, but if you click outside the boxes and then move your mouse, then you can move this thing around. If you look over here on the left, you can see there's a dotted line that shows what I'm viewing right now. And if you hold down shift and then move the wheel, oh, whoops, no, it's control. I'm sorry, control and move the wheel. Now I can zoom in and out of this thing. And so again, this is this is the control flow of this program. And by the control flow, I mean that there are there are um, loops and there are select statements that control the flow of execution of the program. And if we were to run this thing, um, so if I were to run game, you know, it asks me for an integer bet, and it says, what happened? You lose integer bet. Um, okay, so now from that, I can look at this and, and see if I can sort of put together how this thing runs. So, um, beat the house and win. Can you get to a million dollars without going bust, right? So, that was what happened when I first started this program. Beat the house and win. Can you get to a million dollars without going bust? Um, you begin with 1K, your pot is 1,000, and then enter in, enter in your bet. Okay, so you start with 1K. Okay, where's, okay, the, the, the your pot is 1,000 isn't shown here, so let's see if we can figure out where that is. Okay, and here we get, here's this, your pot is whatever. And so it's obviously gonna print out a variable value. And so we know that the initial path of execution is this first part of the program runs and then there is a, um, oh, then it flows through to this. And the reason this is separate is because there's other stuff that comes up and goes into this, right? So there's, there, there's other forks of the program that jump into the execution at this point. And then the first time it runs, it must go over to this and then over to this. So the, the, the way these colors work, you know, there's a jump if less than or equal to, and then there's a pointer to a memory location. And um, that's the, 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 so this is assembly language code, right? So, so CMP is compare. So we're comparing a particular memory location to zero. And then we jump if less than or equal to. So if this comparison is less than or equal to zero, then we, then we jump to this memory location. And that's this. Here we're comparing again and we're jumping if less than or equal to. And so the first time this program is run, you end up right here, right? Your pot is whatever it is, enter an integer bet. And so you see the printf commands, those are printing these, these values. And then, um, uh, then there's a scanf. Okay, scanf, that's where you can, um, 
accept input from the user. So that's the command line input, scanf. And then the program goes down to here and um, basically um, it does a check. So let's see if we can, you know, so, so if I go over to a program, uh, I'm gonna put in a thousand. It's gonna say you can't bet more than your pot. Okay, so here obviously it's checking to see if my bet, checks to see if my bet is greater than my pot. And if it is, then I get an error message that says you can't bet more than your pot. And then it says enter a bet, and then it goes right back up. Oh, uh, I don't know how I did that, but uh, okay. It goes right back up to here, and then it falls through here again, right? So it's checking to make sure that my bet is not more than the amount of money I have. What does it not do though? If you look at this, you, you see the only check it does on the input is to make sure that the bet is not more than the amount of money I already have. So it's, what's it not checking for? That's what I would sort of ask myself. And um, what it's not checking for is it's not checking for a negative bet. So if I make a huge negative bet and lose, then I could cause this program to behave in a way that it shouldn't behave. So if I was to say bet 10, oh, it accepts that. It took the minus 10 bet. It says I lost, but instead of having $967, I have $977. Okay, so it, it basically subtracted that negative value from my pot, and now I have more money than I have before. So that's how this program functions in a way that, you know, you think that it shouldn't, but it obviously it does. So that's how you could get to a solution on this particular program. And we can sort of discover that by, by looking at the, at the flow of execution of the program in a tool like this. Um, you can also, um, you know, so this shows the flow of execution. You can look at the whole program in, um, as just the assembly code, if you hit the space bar, and now it goes to, um, you know, the, the assembly code in sequence, and if you're, more comfortable looking at it that way, then you can look at it that way. And, and you see that it's, you know, Ida breaks it up into chunks and um, makes it easier to read. But, but that's, this is kind of basic usage of, of Ida Pro. Um, and, um, yeah, so that's, that's basic usage of Ida Pro. Next thing I want to do is, um, oh, when I click close, it's going to ask me about packing a database, et cetera. I'm going to click don't save, click OK. <clears throat> so the next challenge I want to look at is, um, is a, a, a challenge called buffer overflow one. And I'm going to, uh, we're going to do a hands-on buffer overflow. So I would, what I would ask you to do is take a screenshot of this and put it somewhere where you can see it. Uh, we're going to use a tool called obj dump, object dump to uh, disassemble this executable program called buffer overflow one. And, and then we're going to discover the address of a function called access granted. And then we're going to, um, do some magic to make it a memory address, no kidding memory address. And then we're gonna use Python to fuzz the program. So remember fuzzing is throwing input into the program until it misbehaves. So we're gonna fuzz the program. We're gonna figure out how many characters it takes us to overflow this buffer that accepts input from this program called buffer overflow one. We'll see that it's gonna take 82 characters. And then we're gonna, we're gonna use Python again. We're gonna push in those 82 characters plus that memory address. And that memory address is gonna overwrite the return address pointer in in um, the stack on this program, and it's gonna. Um, this is a no kidding hands-on buffer overflow, and uh, we're gonna get this program to, to misbehave in a particular way by overflowing a buffer. Basically, we're gonna make the program execute a function that it wouldn't otherwise execute. So. <clears throat> This will be the last bit. So if you're not interested in this, then you can you can shut off now. 
But if you want to do a hands-on buffer overflow on your Kali Linux machine, then um, this I think is a pretty cool exercise. So buffer overflow one, uh, lots of ways to solve this one. One way is using a classic buffer overflow. Can you get the access granted function to execute? The flag is the last name of the author quoted. Okay, so I'm gonna download the program, save it. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so let's do this, let's see that. First of all, I'm gonna stop this program. So um, we have this program called Buffer Overflow 1, and the first thing we have to do is make it executable. Now we can run it. Okay, what does it do? Enter password, password. Ah, access denied, dang it. Okay, so what else might I run on this? I might run strings, um, and I look at it, and I say, is there any string that might be the password? Uh, oh, here's one. This thing called, it's secret, but it's spelled funny. Well, let's try that. Enter a password. Secret. And it says, um, it gives me the answer, right? So this, per, this one I could have solved by um, using strings, but we're going to solve it using a buffer overflow. And then I'll leave it as, as an exercise for you to solve buffer overflow too. And buffer overflow two is not so easily solved by using strings. So first thing we need to do is we need to figure out um, the address of the access granted function. So I'm going to go use a tool called obj dumps. This is all on that slide that I pointed you at. So here's the disassembled program, and I'm going to look for. function called access granted, and it's at this memory address, 080484AC, uh, and that's access granted. What we want to do is get this to, to execute, um, this uh, function to execute uh, without uh, the program actually telling it to do that in the proper way. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do, now I know what that address is, and again, this is on the slide that I told you to make a screenshot of. Now I'm going to use Python to fuzz this program. So if I say Python dash C print A times 50, that's going to print, whoops, it's going to print 50 C, 50 A's. Type. Print 50 A's, right? And now I want to push that into The program. Okay, so um, now if I was to <clears throat> if I was to say print put the password in here, it would do the right thing, right? So it basically takes this the value that you printed and and it gives it to the program as input. And so when the program asks for input from the user, it gives it whatever it is that you put in there. So if I give it 50 A's, it's gonna, um, it's gonna say access denied. If I give it 80 A's, same thing. Okay, so how many A's do I have to give it? If I give it 90 A's, okay. If I give it 90 A's, then it says access denied, then I get this thing called the segmentation fault. And basically what that means is that I'm overflowing the buffer um, and I'm overriding a return pointer in the, in the program executable, and that causes this thing called a segmentation fault. The program crashes, essentially. So um, what if I give it 81? No, oh, it doesn't seg fault. So if I give it 82, okay, this is where the program crashes. Okay, now here's the tricky part. I want to give it my 82 A's plus... I have to give it a um, representation of oops, that memory address. And if you remember, the, the memory address was 080484AC. 
I need to give it that memory address in what's called Little Indian Notation. <coughs> and I guess so quotes. Okay, and when I finally do that correctly, what I get is, um, so I didn't put in the password anywhere, but what I did do is I overflowed the buffer and I overwrote the return pointer in the function that checks the password. And um, I, I overwrote the return pointer with a little endian representation of the memory address of the access ground function that we looked at earlier using object dump. And when I do that, it says, oh, you entered the wrong password, access denied. But when that function ends, the return pointer is overwritten. So it ends up in the access granted function. And then uh, it dumps out the, uh, the output. And then at the end, there's a segmentation fault because, uh, because the access granted function was not uh, entered properly. So, um, so, um, So it cra program crashes essentially because there's no return pointer for it to return to. So this whole notion of overriding um, a return pointer and, and um, doing a buffer overflow, there's lots of uh, online resources that'll, that'll get you to this. You can, uh, you know, you can Google uh, buffer overflows and you can um, see, uh, get a little more, a bit more detail on what this is and why it works. Um, there's a great um, article uh, from uh, uh, from a magazine called Frack Magazine, P H R A K Magazine, written by um, a, a guy whose hacker name was Aleph One. Uh, he wrote a he wrote a paper back in like 1996 um, called "Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit." That's that's like the seminal paper on buffer overflows um, when they refer to, when they first became a thing, and um, it does a great explanation of, of how this all works. Um, and then you can practice this uh, using this slide that I give you that, that walks you through how to do it on this particular uh, uh, executable program called Buffer Overflow 1. And then um, with Buffer Overflow 2, you can basically apply those concepts to do it yourself. Um, and I don't walk you through that one. Okay, so that's all I'm going to talk about reverse engineering for these, for these workshops. Again, this is a fairly advanced topic that um, you know, some high schoolers might get involved in it if they get really uh, into CTFs and they start learning how to do some, some of the more difficult challenges. Certainly something that college students would get involved in if they're doing CTFs. Um, again, it helps to have some understanding of assembly language programming, helps to have some understanding of computer architecture and, um, and uh, operating systems, because then you understand, you know, how, how uh, programs function, you know, internal to the, to the computer itself. Um, and that'll help you understand how the assembly code works and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so um, next time we are going to talk a little bit about reconnaissance challenges. Um, and then I think with that, we're gonna wrap up this series of, of discussions on uh, CTF challenges. But there's, there's probably um, eight or 10 recorded uh, lectures on, on CTF challenges of different types. And so I encourage, um, folks to uh, go back and, and review those and then see if you can solve all the rest of the challenges on this practice CTF. And then when you get to that point, then there's lots of other, lots of other uh, CTFs out there that you can uh, practice on as well. All right, so thanks and we'll see you folks next week.